Today on The Future of Everything, the future of mathematical biology. So we all know that science and engineering lean heavily on mathematics. There are some very famous equations from physics that come to mind. E equals mc squared, to, thank you Einstein, uh, tells us that the amount of energy in a system is related to the mass and the speed of light. F equals ma, tells us that the force uh, exerted on an object is related to its mass and its acceleration. So these equations are not just about theory, though. They lead to predictions and understanding, and in fact, inventions that then impact us, cars, trucks, airplanes, computers, toasters. There are similar, similar famous equations in chemistry, and these are all used to understand the chemical world. However, we don't always and usually think of biology as having core mathematics. Now, Darwin, probably still the most famous biologist, proposed the theory of evolution revolutionary it was, and although he may have used some math in his writing, the main ideas seem qualitative. There's mutation and there's natural selection. Mutation is the change of the genetic code, the DNA for an organism, and natural selection is the degree to which a mutation enables better survival and reproduction of that organism. The organisms that are most fit in their ecological niche thrive, and those that do not do well, well, we don't see them around perhaps. But in this era of huge mathematical, statistical, and computational capabilities, there is increasing interest in bringing the tools of mathematics and, and statistics and computer science to an understanding of biology. If we can understand the detailed mathematics of a biological system, everything ranging from a cell to the human population, then maybe we can build models that make predictions and allow us to create interventions, drugs, or new policies that improve the outcomes that we care about. Professor Noah Rosenberg is a professor of biology at Stanford University and an expert on mathematical biology. Noah, what are the topics in biology that are best poised to benefit from mathematical approaches? Uh, thanks, Russ, for having me on the show. Uh, so in, in biology, uh, especially in areas of population biology, such as ecology, evolution, demography, uh, and epidemiology, uh, we're really interested in, in using mathematics to generate understanding, to understand how phenomena relate to each other, to make predictions about how systems might evolve uh, over time. Uh, so uh, this is an area that's really looking to the future, uh, where we're trying to understand uh, how phenomena relate to each other now, often in advance of having the data that might be possible to collect in order to test hypotheses. Uh -huh. So let me give you an example. Uh, so maybe about 40 years ago, prior to the Human Genome Project, uh, geneticists started thinking about relatedness and how relatedness could be measured from genomes. How you mean literally possible? like I'm related to my mother? Yeah. Uh, so you know, people people are uh, uh, have have a level of relatedness that's detectable uh, from their genetic uh, material. And uh, at that time, it was prior to even imagining what the Human Genome Project might look like. Uh, an entire PhD thesis might consist of sequencing a, a single gene. And some mathematical uh, geneticists uh, were thinking, well, we could evaluate how similar genomes will be as a function of their relationship and make predictions about what level of relationship might be detectable for a pair of genomes without actually being able to collect the data at that time. Uh, so this and, was a coming attraction. Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't really even envisioned uh, that way. Uh, it, was, it was really even before, before the, the Genome Project was even announced. But, but it has turned into a business because in, on my 23andMe, I get emails all the time that they found a fifth cousin of mine. And it, this sounds like it's related to what you're talking about. Right, right, right. So, uh, so, you know the the initial the initial computation uh, was was um, actually uh, suggested that a fifth cousin might be uh, sort of at the level that's that's detectable, and a little bit farther than that, it's very hard to determine if uh, a pair of individuals are are close relationships. Uh, the The study actually um, uh, said this in an interesting way. Uh, it was written by a Scottish geneticist, uh, Kevin Donnelly, working with. Uh, uh, English uh, supervisor Elizabeth Thompson, uh, and he wrote, 
that uh, a person descended from Robert Burns, the Scottish poet who lived 1759 to 1796, uh, would be uh, would share some genetic material with their famous ancestor. But a person descended from the English playwright, William Shakespeare, uh, would likely not share any genetic material uh, with their famous ancestor uh, because uh, the number of generations is so large that there would be so many ancestors from that same time period as Shakespeare that it would be unlikely that Shakespeare himself contributed any genetic material uh, to the descendant. You know, it's funny because you, you of course, there's the uh, traditional potential tension between a, a Brit an English and a Scottish, but actually this can be, as you know, a very sensitive topic because there are, uh, you know, cultural groups that have very strong um, uh, uh, traditions of where they came from and who their ancestors were. And sometimes the genetics doesn't always directly support these models. And it can, as you know very well, become a, a kind of a touchy political cultural situation. Sure, yeah, so I'd, I'd say the uh, most interesting development in this area of genetics and relatedness in the last few years uh, has been in the area uh, of forensic genetics where a few years ago, uh, it was announced uh, that uh, the notorious uh, Golden State Killer uh, uh, in California was identified through new uh, genetic technologies, first by identifying distant relatives in uh, public genetic databases uh, and genetic databases of uh, genetic testing companies. Yes. And uh, through triangulating between the genealogy, uh, it was then possible to identify the suspect uh, for more traditional uh, means. And you know, one thing that was interesting to me about uh, uh, that uh, event uh, was that the level of relationship that was detected was similar to the level of relationship of Robert Burns and his oh, there you go. descendants. Uh, <laughs> So, so, let, so let me ask you about that, because that leads to one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson trial, and then there's this much more recent case. And um, it goes right to this, uh, some, I think one of the challenges of a mathematical approaches to biology is now you're bringing evidence to kind of what I would call regular people, the people on the jury or whatever. And sometimes this mathematics is non-trivial, and the intuitions don't always match up with how the mathematics shake out. And I'm sure that this is uh, constantly something that you have to think about, um, not just for juries, but even for peer reviewers who might be more on the traditional biology side, and they're not thinking about the mathematical model. So how do you bring, um, how do you take the mathematical complexity and turn it into something that people can understand, uh, both your colleagues and also kind of regular people who are just interested? Yeah, uh, so I mean, I think that a lot of, a lot of what uh, the mathematics is is used to do is to generate insights. And often those insights uh, might be possible uh, to summarize uh, in, a, yeah. in a more uh, concise form. And in fact, that's often the goal of a lot of mathematics is uh, to uh, reduce to some relatively uh, simple equations or, or uh, relationships uh, that, that are then uh, possible uh, to use as, as the basis for understanding. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'd say that one area where there's been really great success in the last um, in the last year has been in mathematical epidemiology. Uh, so, uh, in mathematical epidemiology, uh, epidemiologists are writing equations that describe the dynamics uh, of, say, individuals who are susceptible, uh, infected, uh, resi uh, resistant, or recovered. Uh, from disease as well right. as many of us have become yeah. intensely interested in epidemiology yeah. in the last uh, year or so. Yeah, uh, and so at least my reaction at the beginning uh, of the pandemic was, you know, I had been reading much of the work of mathematical epidemiologists over the last two decades, uh, where, you know, they've been posing in these abstract uh, mathematical models questions such as, you know, how soon until an epidemic reaches peak, uh, given its uh, current state, uh, how does the global transportation network uh, uh, affect the spread of a disease around the world? Uh, how do you measure the parameters of an epidemic while it's in progress in the early stages when the data is noisy and unreliable? Uh, how do things like the distribution of the number of contacts people have uh, in a population uh, affect the dynamics when, say, in traditional models, uh, homogeneity among individuals is, is largely assumed? So, you know, these questions are are worked out over many years in uh, abstract form. Uh, and what was really salient to me in, at the beginning of the pandemic was how all the mathematical epidemiologists who had been you know, chugging away at 
uh, abstract mathematical models, you know, finding equilibria, looking at dynamical systems, stability. Uh, we're able to just turn on a dime and put in the assumptions of their uh, suited, suited to their local regions and give predictions that were useful to local policymakers. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Noah Rosenberg, and we just started on talking about some of the uh, very uh, relevant epidemiological mathematical modeling that has happened in the last year. And I, I wanted to ask you, how were those models? So they were working, you know, we can imagine like the unappreciated mathematical epidemiolo epidemiologist who's building these models is unappreciated. Maybe mm -hmm. the whole world doesn't understand the importance of the work. Then all of a sudden, let's say March 2020, the whole world cares deeply about this work H had they done had had the work been done in such a way that it was useful or did it kind of explode the field and, and make people realize that entire different approaches were needed or both i mean wh where what did we learn from that experience yeah uh, let's do maybe let me let me uh start by just telling a little a story about a former student of mine love who, it yes uh, <laughs> uh you know so i i had a student uh Chao Long Wang, who uh, did his uh, phd uh, largely in the first area, we talked about uh, mathematical genetics uh, and found himself uh, a faculty position at the Tongji School of Public Health in Wuhan, China. Ah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I got a, a New Year's greeting from him uh, around December uh, of 2019 uh, before the, the news hit of the epidemic. And when I, last, uh, when I next checked in with him, uh, as the news uh, became quite, quite dire in Wuhan and I asked him how he was doing, uh, he said he had traveled out of Wuhan to a, a safer province during the period uh, before the Chinese New Year when a lot of people were traveling out of Wuhan. And not only that, he was uh, working with the local government on the epidemic uh, modeling oh. of the control measures uh, in Wuhan. And uh, he had developed a number of uh, models that fit quite closely uh, to uh, that epidemic and that were able to measure how effective the various uh, measures were in uh, stamping out the epidemic uh, in Wuhan. And had so, he done this before uh, or was he doing this in response to the challenge? He, he was doing it in response to the challenge and, and he uh, you know, described it as you know, he had been working in this area of mathematical genetics, which has a lot of similarity in the, the mathematics and the style of population biology that's considered uh, to mathematical epidemiology and was able to transfer his expertise uh, quite, quite quickly uh, over to the, the epidemiological uh, models. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I had the chance when, when Stanford uh, uh, was sending uh, our students home uh, in early March and Cha Long had already been through all of this, I asked him if he had any uh, advice for the students in my uh, evolution class. And huh. one, of the, one of the things he said was to pay attention to what they were learning in the class because it might come in handy someday uh, to be useful for, for the world. Wow, and and so um, he was uh, he was able to use his mathematical tools to actually uh, specifically advise local authorities at the policy level about like here's how you do the lockdown, here's the people, uh, here's the situations we want to avoid, and uh, uh, what, what and this was not his normal research. I'm t I take it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that they were they were largely kind of looking at the the dynamics of of the data kind of in real time together with the authorities. Now, now I know that you've done some mm. work on I've lots of work mm. in the pandemic, and and I. I had the privilege of reviewing your recent papers, and one thing that caused mm -hmm. that caught my attention, uh, as you know, we're now in the mm -hmm. middle of a vaccine rollout, and I think mm -hmm. you've done some work on anti-vaccine sentiments and what it would mean for the efficacy and, and, and effectiveness of the vaccine uh, strategies. Yeah, uh, so uh, this is a, a, a work that we started a few years ago in response to the measles epidemic uh, at, at Disneyland. Uh, when we started to think about the idea of anti-vaccine sentiment as a cultural pathogen. So a pathogenic idea uh, that spreads uh, and has a health consequence. It's like a of virus course, of its own. That's right. Uh, and, and of course, that's a quite familiar concept now that we've all been thinking about uh, uh, ideas that, that are potentially uh, harmful in relation to disease. Uh, but at the time, it, it uh, was a less common uh, mathematical approach or an approach in, in epidemiology. Uh, although this has been uh, on the radar of epidemiologists for quite a long time. Uh, so we developed uh, a susceptible infected resistant model uh, that had two dimensions. On one dimension was susceptible infected and resistant with a disease. And on the other dimension was susceptible infected and resistant with 
a culturally pathogenic idea, uh, in particular uh, uh, in this model, uh, anti-vaccine sentiment. So uh, you're so kind of modeling two mm -hmm. pandemics going on simultaneously and interacting. That's right. So uh, epidemics, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, not 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 as uh, uh, widespread as what we have now. Okay. Uh, but I mean, I think one one insight that comes away from that modeling framework is, you know, right now we're having the vaccine rollout with large numbers of people uh, being vaccinated, um, you know, every day. Um, there are a number of mathematically different strategies that uh, can all be. Uh, employed at the same time. And I'm distinguishing mathematically different from, say, different in a marketing or public health uh, uh, approach. Uh, so in terms of anti-vaccine sentiment, right now we have a lot of individuals who are undecided about uh, the vaccine or who are hesitant or uh, not uh, wanting to get the vaccine as soon as it's available. Uh, so in the model, there's a, a class of undecided individuals who can mm -hmm. convert into uh, an anti-vaccine class or who can convert into a pro-vaccine class. And those are two different uh, uh, strategies uh, for moving more people into the vaccinated class. So there's preventing individuals from moving into the va anti-vaccine class, and there's encouraging individuals to move into the pro-vaccine class. And one might think about those as two different things. Right. Uh, so, so in trying to get more people into the vaccinated class, uh, there are also those two steps uh, in moving the undecided uh, individuals. Uh, into that, the that's interesting. Class. So, so mm -hmm. if I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. there may be a value to keeping a person undecided if the alternative is having them become an anti-vax because the, the undecided still gives hope that they'll switch towards vaccine and there'll be general development of herd immunity, et cetera. Um, so are people listening mm -hmm. to your advice? Are there, are there public health uh, agencies that are calling up Dr. Rosenberg and asking for uh, strategy advice? Uh, I, you know, I participated in one one panel in the UK, uh, and it was quite interesting to to hear a lot of the uh, ideas in social science that you know have been considering uh, this this particular uh, problem. I, I think one thing that's been um, uh, interesting to observe that was not part of our model and that was not uh, part of the predictions of our model is that the size of the vaccinated class is shifting a lot of the undecided class uh, into the pro-vaccine class in a quite uh, rapid and, and natural manner. Uh, and uh, that's that's a, a, a novel development in relation to, to the way we were thinking about this right. topic. And, and, we, and I think many of us have seen that just in conversations with friends mm -hmm. and, and family. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Professor Noah Rosenberg next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Noah Rosenberg, and we're talking about mathematical approaches towards biological and health questions. And so we, we had been talking about the pandemic in the previous se segment, uh, and, and I know that you've also done work more generally um, looking at the healthcare system. And so I wonder what kind of questions does a mathematical biologist ask about healthcare versus like basic biological discovery, and what have you found in that work? Right. Uh, so this is this has been a really terrific project uh, that I've uh, worked on with my wife, uh, Donna Zolman, who uh, is a health services researcher, and she uh, studies healthcare fragmentation. So the extent to which uh, the healthcare system, especially in the United States, is is fragmented, uh, where people get their care from a lot of different providers that aren't necessarily talking to each other right. through the electronic health record or or otherwise. So in medicine, and, so just to mm -hmm. say, in medicine, we talk about this idea of continuity of care. And generally, it, it's a pretty basic idea that the doctor who knows you already is likely to make better decisions than the doctor who just met you five minutes ago. And if you have a choice between the two, you might go for the one who actually already knows you. That's my right. one minute summary of fragmentation. Right, right. And you mentioned the continuity of care, right? So we've been working actually with a uh, uh, a mathematical formula uh, known as the continuity of care index. Huh. And what uh, I noticed just in, in, in talking with Donna about uh, the formulas she was using for measurement of healthcare fragmentation, uh, that this continuity of care index, which measures the extent to which patients are getting uh, care uh, from different providers, uh, turns out to have the same mathematical structure as formulas that we use in genetics uh, to measure homozygosity and heterozygosity. So the extent to which alleles in individuals in a population huh. are identical uh, or different. 
Uh, so it's a similar uh, concept, you know, the extent to which the doctor you see this time is the same doctor that you saw last time or a different doctor. Uh, how many doctors are you seeing? What are the probabilities that when you see a doctor, it's uh, a doctor you've seen before or a new doctor or uh, a doctor in a different specialty? Uh, and it's it's a very analogous concept yeah, to yeah, when I you sample an allele in a population, uh, you know, is it is it the same allele, uh, the same allelic type or a new allelic type? Uh, and so uh, some of the questions that they uh, noticed uh, uh, some of the phenomena that they noticed were that some of the indices they were using seemed to be quite correlated. Uh, and uh, I was able to uh, find that actually they're correlated for a reason that we already understood in genetics, uh, which is that uh, these different measures of continuity of care or measures of healthcare fragmentation are capturing the same structure of this probability distribution of uh, probabilities of seeing particular doctors or probability of sampling a particular allele in a population. Uh, so, uh, you know, so it, it, it provides some statistics uh, for uh, proceeding in, in her work uh, on determining the extent to which healthcare fragmentation uh, has an effect on uh, outcomes, patient outcomes. Yeah, so, so if, if I'm understanding correctly, this insight about the uh, underlying distribution would then allow them perhaps to get a cleaner signal or a more or, or a or a more relevant signal to when this fragmentation is is present first of all, and then when it's causing more problems versus less problems for the patients and for the outcomes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's improving the the mathematical basis of this work in in healthcare yeah. research. And then you get to talk about it at the dinner table with the family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, really, really fun project. Yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine. Uh, absolutely. So uh, th another thing that I definitely wanted to ask you about was the work you've been doing uh, looking at Neanderthal uh, genomes. So for those who haven't been following this in the last five years, there's actually been an, uh, an amazing ability to take old samples from uh, 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 Neanderthal bones and even intact Neanderthals that have been found in the ice and stuff like that, uh, and get pretty good sequences of the Neanderthal genome. And we know that they were, I mean, I'm not an expert at this, but they were roughly speaking around Europe, uh, I think 50 or 60,000 years ago, please correct me if I'm wrong. That might be wrong, maybe 600. I'm going to let you give the, the facts. Um, what have you been studying and why does this actually begin to impact healthcare? Because that's the surprise. Everybody thinks, well, they're extinct. Why would they impact our healthcare today? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so we've had a really interesting project. Uh, this is work of uh, postdoc uh, Gilly Greenbaum, who's now at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, he uh, posed this question of uh, to what extent could infectious disease in humans? and Neanderthals uh, have been transferred between the two groups huh. in the region of the Levant where those two groups coexisted side by side for quite a long time. Uh, so it's a question about the infectious di disease dynamics between two neighboring groups that are genetically similar enough that they may be able to share uh, infectious diseases. So the idea would be that, you know, perhaps modern humans coming out of Africa carried a lot of pathogens that had come with them uh, from, from the tropical region, uh, and Neanderthals uh, had a different set of pathogens uh, that they had accumulated in the temperate regions, and that in this region, in the Middle East, uh, it might have been possible for uh, the Neanderthals to not be immune to pathogens from modern humans, and the modern humans to not be immune to pathogens from Neanderthals, and this boundary between them two have persisted for a long time, possibly as a result of the infectious disease dynamics. And just to state the obvious, because of that potential exposure, that would put huge selective pressures on both groups in terms of their genetic development over the, I, I presume that this is what you were thinking, that mm -hmm. if there was this signal of a strong new pressure, we might see, uh, you know, anthropo geo, we might see evidence of it in the genome. That's right. So this is an exa exactly an example of uh, a mathematical model uh, that's trying to understand the dynamics of something we've we've just imagined based on our understanding of infectious disease and where the Neanderthals were located and when. Uh, we don't have evidence in the genome, but we have a model that enables predictions about what type of evidence might be possible to huh. find. Huh. Uh, so it's it's not unlike some of the topics we were discussing at, at the beginning, where uh, right now we're 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 ahead of the data on this topic, uh, just as uh, geneticists were in the in the 1980s. Uh, before the Human Genome Project. Uh, it, it's actually, um, you know, I, I, uh, I edit a journal in this field uh, called Theoretical Population Biology, and one of our 
European reviewers uh, put this very well when he was reviewing uh, a paper. He, he commented uh, on this paper um, uh, by referencing an anecdote about Beethoven. Uh, so, um, so when Beethoven had produced his um, middle uh, violin concertos, uh, one of the violinists, uh, his uh, sorry, his middle uh, string, string, string quartets, one of the yeah. violinists who was uh, going to uh, play them uh, um, commented to Beethoven that, that, you know, he didn't think that these string quartets were music, uh, to which Beethoven responded, well, I, I didn't write them for you, they're for a later age. Ah. And, <laughs> Uh, and and that's really the flavor of of work in mathematical biology, you know we're we're doing the work now, uh, but potentially the applications are are quite far in the future, and you know my feeling in the pandemic is that we've been living in the later age. Yeah. So let me ask about that Neanderthal work. Um, does it make uh, so yes, I understand that we can't, we don't have the data currently to either validate or invalidate it, but can you imagine the data existing? In other words, is it a, a, a foreseeable capability that sometime in the future we'll be able to test these theories? Sure, yeah. So there's a lot of different signals that infectious diseases leave in genomes in terms of natural selection or remnants of ancient viruses. Uh, so uh, there's a possibility of, of generating tests of, of the hypothesis. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me very much, as you know, in the beginning comments, I was talking about physics, and I think I even mentioned mm -hmm. Einstein. And as you know very well, some mm -hmm. of Einstein's predictions were only confirmed decades after his death. So this is a similar thing now for biology. Absolutely. So, so tell yeah. me, it, it, we yeah. have about a minute mm -hmm. left. Tell mm -hmm. me what the future is. You're, especially as an editor mm -hmm. of a journal, you must have mm -hmm. a view of the landscape of theoretical and mathematical biology. Uh, what, what are the things you're excited about going forward? Yeah. So, I, I mean, in some ways, I think it's it's kind of a golden age for mathematical modeling and biology. Uh, you know, we have new forms of data uh, coming online that uh, we're, we're now starting to think about it. Say one, one thing with the pandemic uh, that's been new is mobility data, uh, especially uh, you know, in, in looking at local dynamics. There's been a lot of new uh, types of data on uh, measuring behavior, uh, human behavior. Uh, and um, uh, in population biology, we're also thinking about animal behavior as well. Uh, and you know, even though there's so much uh, discussion of the big data era that we're in now, uh, I'd say that you know, even, even though the big data era might tend to drown out fundamental mathematics and theory, I think it's quite the opposite, uh, that as the data uh, continue to grow, uh, it generates more opportunities for mathematics, uh, and that we'll continue to see mathematical biology grow as a field. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.